welcome back everybody. Time to jump back in. We're appreciating your participation today. And um, again, this is the Best Agile Articles Conference and we're hosting 2018 authors in today's conference. And we have with us Gene Gendel. Um, I believe I said his name right, but please fix that if I am not saying it right. And um, we'll let you um, introduce your topic and give yourself a little bit bigger introduction, Gene. Uh, so uh, I guess let me start sharing. And uh, I guess the floor is mine. Is that what we're saying? I can kick off? You sure can. Uh, okay. Well, I'm okay. Cool. Let me uh, just maximize. It, it's kind of psychologically important for me to see as many faces as I can. So let me expand this pane. Uh, okay. And you all see my screen, right? Do you? Yeah, we sure do. Excellent. Oh, okay. So, so I'm not so good at introducing myself. Um, I'll just fire up my picture here and a bit of my bio, personal bio. It's on my site. If you wish, you can look it up. Um, I'm, I have been in industry probably long enough to, be, you know, to, to say uh, I, I I jumped on a bandwagon before it became too popular. <laughs> and um, I say it facetiously because these days Agile is the is the mainstream and this terminology has been so brutal, brutally overused and misused. Um, I think I have a bit of a privilege to say I, I looked into agility before agility became the mainstream. But with that, I'm going to leave it up to you to do um, um, you know, research or, or look up if you wish. I have my website, like I said, I try to make it very transparent up front. I'm very accessible and uh, people that wish to uh, connect directly, they can do it by email or LinkedIn or on my site itself or the meetup that I run, large scale scrum meetup of New York City is the biggest one in the world. It's one of a few communities that I run. Um, also my free Slack channel is to your um, to your, at your disposal. Um, you can always ping me there if you have any questions. And um, I do, you know, online coaching and training as well. So you can, you can put it all up in my site. So, um, so without any further ado, I'm going to jump into the subject. So today's subject is um, um, dynamic forecasting and, and um, you know, scaling. How do these two come together? So let me uh, parse a few um, uh, statements that I prepared for you, and I'm going to literally paraphrase those statements. So traditional budgets represent a retrospective look at past situation and conditions that may not be any longer applicable in a future. Uh, even accurate assumptions uh, get added if cycle time is long. Uh, time consuming processes in additional financial overhead to the organization would be um, the result of conventional traditional budgeting. Uh, rigid budgets often lead to fear of experimenting and researching. Uh, this is something that we really need to see uh, agile teams doing. So if they are rigidly constrained by uh, non-agile budgeting, uh, we will uh, at least like to see them trying to experiment and innovate. Uh, most metrics are very subjective, <laughs> at least in my experience, as they make, um, uh, you know, as they go up the chain of command and turn into rack statuses. Uh, when used as a yardstick to assess individual performance, performance typically uh, becomes, um, it leads to an unethical behavior and system. Now, this is probably obvious to me, but if it's not, I actually recommend reading this book by Jard Boxness, who's a pretty well respected person in this space, um, spending a lot of time with HR and finance and, and speaks a lot on agile. Um, Agile budgeting. So, agile budgeting, dynamic budgeting, uh, those are the things that are synonymous. Now, um, very quick introduction to economics of labor, and this is a simple, simplified version of it. Now, I mentioned, so I'm going to use very simple uh, arithmetics here. You have uh, hourly rate, and you know, it's times labor hours, and it's equal to cost of labor. Now, if I if I was the one who was doing work, if this was my average hourly rate, depending on what kind of labor I perform, what kind of labor I do, then um, roughly my, my own estimation of labor hours uh, would translate into the budget that my client needs to pay me. They're just simple math. I, of course, there could be some limitations to it, 
but it's probably the very basic formula, right? Uh, that is if only one person does work, me. Now imagine if I was a part of the team, a part of the team that did work, uh, so maybe more people, not just my, myself, maybe two or three, three to nine people, like let's say pick a scrum team with a recommendation of three to nine individuals. So this formula, although it will be still accurate, there would be some additional um, questions or attributes that need to be applied to this former formula it would become a little more complex. Now, imagine if you have multiple teams, you know, three by nine times X number that were working together, then this formula would be obviously still accurate, but not um, so that we need more coefficients, more permutations, more variables in the formula. And that just common sense, right? Because you would have to make sure that everyone normalizes their ability to estimate work. Uh, you would have to figure out how to calculate hourly rate, which is, which is dependent on individual rates. So there would be some additional uh, permutations to this. Now, now this is really now becomes a different subject now. Instead of trying to um, hold the question of how do we accurately uh, budget, uh, we need to look to the root, uh, root goal, like the, the root goal or, or the uh, upstream goal. How do we accurately estimate our work? Because let's say uh, hourly um, rate is the same or, or um, cost per a unit, of, unit of work is, um, is a constant. But there is a variable, number of hours. So an S becomes a variable. So this is really the, qu the question kind of shifts now. Uh, in order to be able to do accurate budgeting, we need to uh, do other things. We need to est estimate um, other things. So uh, I'm proposing to you to use um, uh, a very, um, in my view, very powerful, very s s uh, effective way to model your system. And when I say the system, I don't mean, I don't mean a software or hardware or a product, uh, organizational system or ecosystem where things happen. So I'm gonna let, let, let's work backwards from the goal. If the system goal is um, to do accurate budgeting, so let's see if, if we take this as a variable, what is required in make a, to increase, increase the likelihood of accurate budgeting? So uh, when we system mo modeling, by the way, we look at different, um, um, uh, different uh, annotations and one of the important, important annotations in which direction is, a is your variable going? Is it going up or is it going down? In, um, in, vo in volume or, or in strength. Here is the likelihood of accurate budgeting. We want it to go up, obviously. So, um, assume to that, the likelihood of having accurate estimations. And if you disagree, please let me know why. Um, in order to have um, higher um, accuracy and estimations, we would like to see consistency and reliability of estimation techniques by people uh, and respective teams. Uh, at the same time, a likelihood of, uh, that having too many wrong people or teams being involved in estimation should be the opposite, it should be going down. So if you have too many people or too many teams that are improperly glued together, trying to engage in um, estimation, the prob probability of, of these estimations not being accurate is going to be higher. Now, proper team design and duration of working together, if we take it as a variable, would also have input um, respectively to, to these variables. To one variable will have a direct um, positive input, so high is gonna lead to high, and here is gonna be the opposite. O stands for the opposite, by the way. So proper team design and duration of working together will increase probability that estimation techniques would be good, would be, would be, would, would be effective. And it will decrease probability, the likelihood that, that wrong people are involved in so-called estimations. And when I say so-called, I mean uh, inaccurate estimations or unreliable estimations. Now, organizational ability to distinguish and see real value in real scaling, for example, of Scrum, uh, and being able to delineate between real Scrum and copy-paste Scrum or a fixed Scrum uh, is, is important here. So high is gonna lead to high, okay? And this is, of course, uh, also going to be impacted by existence of proper product definition, proper backlog definition, and customer centricity in development. Now, just um, while I'm talking to you through this thinking, through this logic, I'm also 
almost passively, indirectly, implicitly introducing this pretty important technique we use in large scale scrum and other uh, system modeling um, um, exercises. Uh, these annotations mean uh, opposite. This thick arrow means drastic impact. Uh, these thick lines mean, uh, uh, you know, important variable, important significance of, the, of this variable. And of course, typically what we see happening to increase uh, accuracy of estimate, sometimes what we do, well, what do we do? I mean, we have so many people involved, their estimates are not accurate. We need to kind of bring this glue this all together. So as we have, we have sense for a quick fix. We throw in additional people into the, the pool. Uh, these are, uh, you know, managers or, or leads or people that act as estimators on behalf of others. And those that have seen traditional estimation techniques um, at organizations, you will probably, you know, you can recognize this. So, of course, this is a challenge. Now, um, this is just a pass through, um, you know, I'm gonna obviously share the deck with you. These are those annotations I'm referring to if you ever want to read or experiment with a uh, system model and exercise. In fact, this is called cause, a causal loop diagram because we look for cause and effect between different variables. This is the way to refer to it. Now, uh, so now we have to shift this conversation all together. Instead of looking for the best ways to budget, we need to look for, um, you know, we need to look for answers to these questions. What are people working on? Who is estimating? Why are they estimating in the first place? What drives them to estimate? What purpose are they trying to um, complete? Uh, what purpose are they trying to meet? And how often are they estimating? Is it just once every half a year or every month? Or do they re-estimate almost, you know, every sprint, every week, every day? Uh, I'm going to probably see the obvious, right? Um, if we talk about this picture, obviously everyone recognizes this is just one team, uh, basic Scrum as is defined in Scrum Guide. One product owner, one product, uh, customer interested product development team that is stable, live, functional, component, cross component centric, and obviously potential, uh, one PSPF, potential shippable product increment comes out in the tail end of it. Uh, but in order for us to estimate, in order for us to estimate accurately by a single scrum team, of course, uh, we're not even talking about dollars or, or yens or, or other currencies. In order to estimate in, um, in um, you know, but by using agnostic techniques like story point estimation or uh, t-shirt size or maybe or dog breeds, we need to have a properly structured, Right, and it just let's just assume for this argument, we were able to achieve this. We do have um, a team of individuals understand each other's work, and they can speak uh, wisely, and and uh, you know, they, they, they can appreciate size and complexity of work on hand, uh, being looked upon from different perspectives: um, a developer, a tester, an architect, um, you know, an analyst. Of course, these are skills, not roles, from. So, uh, in order for this to be healthy and, and, and accurate, we need to have a real team. <laughs> now, even if, even if you had a real team now, and if someone said, well, how about, you know, five teams or eight teams? Well, truth be told, if you just do this, copy and paste, copy and paste these ad hoc created, unrelated teams, uh, you're going to end up with what's referred to as copy and scrum. These are really, this is not real scrum. The, the, this is not scaling. This is just having a bunch of teams uh, kind of stapled together. And usually there is a reason why this is happening. O oftentimes these teams are not even true feature set. These are component teams. And, and the, the, uh, the most typical reason I've seen, especially with large organizations, why it's happening is because of this. Some sort of an internal game, or some sort of an internal pressure. We need to become more agile. We need to become more agile by, the NFA, by, by year end. And um, it turns into a system game and exercise of, um, you know, of checking box. Yes, we have five teams. We have eight scrum teams. We have 20 scrum teams. Why? Well, because they all are in Jira or in some other, you know, electronic tool of record. They're managing stuff there. So, that was better. so of course, if you have this um, pressure, organizational uh, pressure or, you know, anchoring to, to become a more agile, you may end up with what copy paste scrum. Now, let me take you a little further on this in this conversation. Uh, these are two classic scrum enter patterns. 
the first one is pretty easy to see when you have it's all it's almost like a mini waterfall within scrum you have access sprint and then design and then a bunch of development sprints and then something at the tail end that is testing only one PSPI coming off the assembly line in the end. This is easy to see, and this is not so easy to see, by the way. This is multiple teams scrumming together. They, they have their own sprint, but we are very, I'm, uh, usually I'm, I'm very skeptical about what is it that they work on that requires so much integration and bug fixing in the end that usually takes more than one sprint. And usually the reason being is because these are not real scrum teams. These, these are not feature teams. These are component teams that have lots and lots of work that is required at the tail end of it. Um, reasons, well, product definition is weak. Applications and components are being treated as uh, so-called features, real features that are, com that are components. <laughs> Doing Scrum efforts are often a result of trying to meet some, um, as I mentioned, agile transformation goals, usually year-end goals. Uh, territorial code ownership, you don't touch my code, they don't touch yours because there's a private code policy, typically. They are, they are not real, they are manufactured and they are built, uh, built around um, sphere of control and, and internal control and jurisdiction. Uh, Top-down command and control and governance. Important of Scrum Dynamics is being trivialized and, and is being viewed as secondary to this original structure blueprint. Uh, of course, if you don't have enough, uh, you know, single specialty workers are more important than having T-shaped workers, that's gonna be another reason a bunch of UI UX designers running a design sprint is a classic indication of component-centric Scrum-like development, not really Scrum. Um, absolutely no meaningful changes that support Scrum team design because uh, agility at large, agility at scale requires intimate involvement of HR. Um, instituting fake teams, what do I mean by it? Well, imagine this, and this is a bit of a digression, but it's, it's, a, bigger, it's, it's a part of a bigger problem. <laughs> if you have an existing organizational structure, if you just flip on its side 90 degrees and not call it a community, or as you may hear the word uh, frequently used, a chapter, uh, it's an example of a masquerade. It is very rarely translated into a true community because if you preserve reporting lines and management relationships and other things like individual performance, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a community. So that is usually doesn't come along. This problem does not appear by itself. It renders with something else. For example, if you take um, an existing large group that is that consists of six specialty workers, um, typically managed by engagement managers, like for instance, you have a bunch of vendors that give you resources and you have to staple them together because you have to command and control them then you uh, artificially staple them together and call it, well, here's a squat. It's another nice term that I've heard of a plenty. Now, if you take this and shove it into what's called a tribe, right, uh, with, uh, with what's typically another way of relabeling an, an existing large body of work I've seen, uh, take an existing portfolio and just relabel it and call it a tribe and uh, put these things now recall uh, relabeled squads and shove them into a tribe. Now the question becomes now, can this cumulative estimation by all of these so-called teams be more accurate? So now I just ask yourself this question. We really haven't changed anything about underlying dynamics. Can estimation by these uh, very traditionally designed groups of people can it be any better just because it changed terminology? Um, in my experience, it quick question. Really give, uh, uh, Sure, we can. We can yeah, no, no, I mean, no. It, it's uh, your audio is kind of coming in and out a little. Just, just so you know. Uh, just oh, so maybe, my apologies. Uh, no, it's okay. Maybe you just push the, you know, the audio button on the computer to, in, you know, to, 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 to increase the, the Wi-Fi link or whatever. Um, if you have that. Is it still the problem? Am I still uh, spotty? No, that's that's better now. Better. Okay. Okay, uh, tell me if, if, I'm go if I'm becoming spotted, just spot, uh, stop me, please. Okay, um, so moving on on the same subject, take a bunch of teams, whether they are properly structured scrum teams or quasi scrum teams, as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. If, it's, if you think of this from a standpoint of customer centricity you know, and proximity to a paying customer or an internal user uh, that, who is gonna be using your system, obviously you wanna have very direct line you want to have very close proximity so there is no translation 
or interim, um, you know, layering that happens in between uh, where between Gemba, where action takes place and work gets created, that value gets created, and value gets consumed. You want this to be a very short conduit. Now, if you see this, obviously, without passing too much judgment on the existing commercially successful approaches, uh, but just think conceptually. If you have too many managers and conductors and coordinators, and you know KPIs and rags and metrics and stuff that it just really surrounds and about your teams with multiple layers that sit on top of it, then of course the question becomes, uh, what is this communication going to be like? How will your team be able to accurately estimate it and communicate to your customers? And how will uh, something as important as priority and reprioritization flow back onto your teams? So it always becomes a question of customer centricity, uh, longevity, length of your feedback loops between real customers and developers. Uh, of course, the adaptiveness or agility or fast reaction uh, that teams should uh, uh, demonstrate towards a customer becomes a question. And of course, you need to ask a question, what has really changed, right? Uh, so this is another way of, of, of indirect hinting that with this sort of setup, with such a long proximity between a customer and real teams, and I'm referring to this red convoluted snake, um, opportunity to est estimate and communicate estimates to your clients accurately um, are se severely, uh, seriously hindered. Uh, of course, you will ask, you know, is estimation, can estimation be anywhere accurate? <laughs> um, somewhere similarly, if you have fractal scaling, you got uh, lots of coordination between teams, excessive coordination, these arrows, these black arrows mean um, too much uh, cross team coordination, not directly by teams, but uh, respective conduits through Scrum Masters and through TOOs. You may not be familiar with the term just yet, you will be familiar with, with it in just in a few seconds. So you, when you don't have direct communication between teams, um, actually teams working together, estimating together, when you have too much, uh, too much layering in between and too much excessive coordination, like Scrum of Scrums and Scrum of Scrum of Scrums and Scrum of Scrum of Scrum, of Scrum of Scrums, you end up with information being lost in translation, okay? Um, I promise to mention to you, and of course, these are just, um, you know, pockets of teams. Imagine if you have many teams, and of course, your estimation, your overarching estimation is going to be much less reliable because um, there's something about product development, this, uh, about software product development. Uh, it's called variability of variance. It grows exponentially with number of teams being involved, with number of people being involved, and with, with the number of communication channels that are being, in, that being um, utilized. Uh, TO actually stands for team output order, something that we don't recommend in Scrum, uh, one, one relationship, because with that comes lots of, come, come, comes lo lots of problems, such as local optimization, uh, because the team private backlogs, there, there's a coordinating overhead, um, there's there's some other stuff that we don't really recommend having. So uh, you know you, you have one team having one proton, it's a one to one ratio everywhere. It becomes very fractal. With that, um, our ability to estimate accurately is going to be hindered. Uh, another example, an, an, another prediction where scaling will not be uh, in support of accuracy of estimation would be. Uh, this when and some organizations, many let, let me rephrase it almost any organization that I know has um, multi content uh, cross continental presence or mul multiple geographies. Uh, with that, could come a distribution of teams and, and, and departments of technology. Now, the challenge is this is a good challenge on its own because they're not complicated, but uh, there's a big challenge if you actually use external vendors that are very very contractually bound to you as a client, and those contracts are not written to support agile ways of working. This is, in fact, another great opportunity to cause a loop diagram and system modeling how these uh, um, traditionally designed, traditionally designed uh, contracts that are, you know, real legal external contracts and SOWs and SOWs, SOWs and 
um, adversely impact adaptive actual ways of working and engage with external people. Um, imagine this um, graphic uh, or, or consider this graphic. You have a client company uh, that uh, leverages assistance um, from multiple vendors. Actually, it should be vendor A, B, C, and D. Consider them as you know as a typo. So each vendor represents uh, is represented by an engagement lead. Why? Because that's it. That's the usual setup. There's someone on site or someone who is primary go-to person uh, through uh, whom all communication and and coordination takes place. Now these people manage and provide estimates on behalf of their people. It's just the, the usual traditional setup. The actual so-called teams, and I put them in quotes for a reason, because these are really not true teams, these are just groups, groups of people, are stapled together. Um, you can put them somewhere in the cloud, right? And they do mandate work with lots of uh, cross-team dependencies. Now, these different colleagues il illustrate um, uh, that, um, and they actually uh, imply that People representing different vendors are being just being staple, stapled together temporarily uh, on temporary projects. So these are not real teams. And uh, it's hard to call this a true scaling. Just because you have many teams or many groups does not really qualify to call them true scaling. With that comes lots of coordination and lots of inaccuracies in between. Uh, it's when you estimate it and when you, um, you know, try to work together. So just adding A to B is not going to produce A, B. Um, adding five hours plus eight hours uh, is not going to um, translate into 13 hours, just because the, 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 there will be lots of uh, upstream, downstream dependencies. And um, you know, as you know, there's a lot of cascading, um, cascading lateness that may, we, may, we may see. So if one task is coming late by three hours, it does not mean that the uh, downstream test is going to come in uh, late by three hours as well. Most likely, it will be by five or maybe you know six hours late. <laughs> so of course, this is not the way to uh, scale, and this is you know would be would be unfair to assume that this kind of organizational setup can produce um, um, accurate estimation. And then of course, uh, all of the above will require lots of coordination and orchestration and delegation responsibilities and dependence manage management and that of course was going to lead well we need managers to manage dependencies right so we're going to end up with lots of locally optimized roles individuals that are procured they are asked to join just to do this um, specific task of estimating on behalf of others um, so we will grow in the organization instead of shrinking instead of making it leaner simpler Therefore, of course, um, this will lead to errors, omissions, and finger pointing and blame gaming. Because if um, estimates do not um, uh, turn out not to be accurate, if estimates are being shifted or being unmet when uh, commitments are being met, this is the a class, classic example of an, it's called an internal contract. When a perfectly uh, well designed, uh, externally um, written, a legal contract translates into an internal contract, but um, uh, of course you are looking for for the for the for the low cow. Who is going to be responsible for this? Usually, people that are doing work uh, end up getting the short end of the stick. Although their estimates were barely ever taken into consideration, and 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 even though if they were asked, uh, most likely uh, as those estimates went up the chain of command and translation, when they got to um, real customers. It was just, uh, they, they were not accurate. They're no longer authentic. And uh, of course, uh, in, estim in estimation and budgeting, uh, we're gonna have lots of these errors and, and emissions and uh, all these problems. And this will, is gonna lead to financial miscalculations. And I'm kind of taking you through this, um, you know, I'm taking you to the darker zone of it. The darker zone of it would be budget cuts because if you've miscalculated your budgets, if you have miscalculated your finances, you're gonna to have to pay dearly for it. Usually it's a budget cut. And of course, unfortunately, it's a forced reduction of some sort, okay? Or something similar to, to forced reduction. You're gonna to have to cut, uh, you're gonna to have to cut out somewhere. Something, something has to give. So, and therefore all these great techniques, estimation techniques, and I'm in fact, um, I'm very 
intimately familiar with many of them and I have used them and I have recommended these. Uh, you know, course estimation versus fine grade estimation, day and hours versus story. So all these, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to paraphrase them, you can read them. They're great, but they become sort of trivial, trivial uh, in the context we're having, in the, context, in the context we have described, because it doesn't matter how sophisticated and intuitive your estimation techniques are, if they're not being properly applied or being used by uh, organizational structure, structures that are not meant uh, to use them, then you should not be expecting much accuracy from those. It's almost like this. Uh, this is, may not be the best analogy. You take all of these sophisticated gadgets, speedometer, alt altitude meter, gas meter, oil pressure um, gauge. If you put it on a bicycle, you're not really going to get much out of it because they just, you know, as, as sophisticated and as fancy as they are, a bicycle is not going to become more sophisticated and a more reliable vehicle from them. So as much as all of these great techniques could be used, in fact, I would recommend experimenting with these uh, with one single properly structured cross-functional feature team, okay, Scrum team, and see if, if they should work. If you properly structure a team, these are ama these amazing techniques. Whether they're supported by tool tooling or not, I prefer not to use tooling for this. Yes, these are great techniques. But once you start uh, mis, uh, misusing the term or team, when, when you build together a wrong team or create a team that is really not a team, uh, but just a bunch of people stapled together by organizational structure, these become trivial. It's, they're fancy, they are you know, cute. You can even call them you know, good looking. But in the end, uh, they're really not bringing too much value. It's like another analogy. It's like putting a saddle on a cow. It's not going to make it into a horse. Okay. That's you know that's my uh, way to draw uh, to create an analogy here. <laughs> um, anyway, are there any alternatives? Uh, hopefully so. Hopefully so. So if you go back to our good old uh, Scrum of three to nine people uh, working together, um, you know on the same product for the same product owner out of the same product backlog. Um, even if not everyone can do everything. In other words, you have a cross-functional team, which is you, what, what you have, but individuals on the team are full cross-functional. I mean, you, win, you want each person to be skilled uh, deeply in one skill set and have broader expertise, maybe more shallow, but a breadth of knowledge. That's what we call a key person. Even if we don't have this um, situation, we, or maybe it was with some way, some way have, have way to, to, to this nirvana state. At least if people understand each other's language, if they understand complexity and size uh, being, present, being described by different skills and different domain expertise, uh, the domain expertise people, then at least we're getting somewhere, um, right? And, uh, that's that's what we that's going to start with. if we have a properly structured team this is at least something that's required right um but what if we have multiple teams what if we have what if, what if you have two let's say six or five or six or seven teams uh, how would that play out now let me um give you another analogy now multiple teams doing their own scrum versus multiple real teams sprinting together on the same this is the same thing Maybe this will help understanding. You got a bunch of horses, uh, you know, chasing against each other, trying to get to the finish line. They have different jockeys. Uh, maybe less analogy with the product owner, but just for the sake of argument, um, different strategy, different vision, different vision, different mission. Of course, they all want to win. This is really not true scaling. If e each horse was a team, this is really not true scaling of an effort. You're not really amplifying an effort by one team in sixty. This is Everyone chases it on their own. Now, this is more analogous with real scaling. When you got multiple horses, one jacket, one product owner, right? pull it in the same direction, on the same cadence, same purpose, same strategy, vision, mission, and goal. That was more of uh, real scaling. Um, take a look at this. Uh, same sprint, same cadence, real cross-functional teams on the same heart, on the same clock, sprinting together. Uh, doing coordination and integration directly seamlessly without any translation layers, right? 
And again, hint, hint, in large Scrum, that's what we do. We don't have any translation layers, not Scrum masters or managers coordinating between teams to coordinate, uh, coordinate themselves. So with that, of course, comes some additional advantage, additional beauty, right? You, they can refine work together, they can plan work together, and they can coordinate directly. And of course, they estimate together as well. And usually, you know, when we teach us from, uh, um, amongst many other things about organizational design system dynamics, one of the big aha moments for people will, how can you do that? Three to nine people on one single scrum team. Uh, and how many teams can you allow in large scale scrum? Well, we recommend to eight teams. So you do the math and nine, the, top, the upper limit, nine times the upper limit of eight turns out to be roughly 70, 70, 70 man operation just on technology side. Yeah, well, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, we'll get that just in a minute, but obviously uh, it takes longer to discuss it, but by properly structuring uh, Scrum and large scale Scrum events, and large scale Scrum is Scrum, by the way. It isn't Scrum on, underneath of a large organizational structure buried somewhere, it's Scrum. Scaling, a large scale Scrum is Scrum that's scaled up to eight teams. With, a, with proper organizational design, which, you know, it's a, it's a very loaded, statement what does it really mean to have a proper organizational design but having that accomplished we can achieve uh, a lot of dynamicity a lot of fluidity in estimation and, and coordination that is direct between teams um, another a graphic illustration of how things could work together and, and how they do work together imagine there are five teams working side by side five, five the feature teams scrum teams we don't we, we just don't use uh, additional terminology in large scale scrum it is implied that it's a feature team. It is implied that it's a cross-functional feature team. Uh, they may not necessarily be of the same size. It could be some, you know, five people, seven people, four people. But um, same product, same product owner, uh, user community, uh, users or um, um, users or people that you know, users or stakeholders that uh, provide clarification, and a product owner that provides prioritization. They work, work very seamlessly, very closely together. There is very little, there's, there, is, there is no uh, work-related coordination between teams that goes through Scrum Masters. Scrum Masters in large-scale Scrum focused on something completely different, okay? Um, I can explain, but of course, we may not have enough time. But coordination and orchestration and, and uh, looking for opportunities to work together, it happens directly between teams. With this setup, of course, um, there's gonna be a high degree of richness in collaboration between teams. I'm gonna pass these, uh, I'm gonna do a pass through these uh, couple of slides just to, um, I'm gonna kind of fast forward because each slide is very loaded. Uh, in large scale Scrum product backlog refinement, uh, spring planning, uh, spring review and retrospective. It invites certain people, certain representatives um, in, certain instances, in certain instances, they're these just representatives, but for the most part, for those key critical uh, large-scale Scrum events, uh, everyone attends. These yellow boxes, these yellow boxes um, speak to that. Uh, during product backlog refinement, when teams work together and refine backlog items, teams do it together. This is a great opportunity to hash out may, any potential opportunities to work together. Of course, estimation can, play, can, can take place here as well. Uh, during sprint planning, it is strongly encouraged for teams to, to plan work in respect to sprint backlogs together. In fact, we usually say we don't like blue boxes. If there is any, any reason why a team should do things on their own, uh, we try to discourage it as we can. So consider this as, as, a, as, a, as an edge case. Um, again, it's a loaded slide, I understand. We need to speak in depth and at length about less events, but we, uh, by yellow boxes, uh, we effectively say uh, people work together. Um, and of course, with this setup, there is a high probability that people can estimate together. In fact, whether we're in the same big room or we're separated by geography, we strongly recommend uh, bringing real doors together um, and get them in, getting them involved in refinement and estimation. Excuse me. 
uh, the main goal is really obviously, like with any estimation, not to produce a number, but to have a three C card uh, conversation and confirmation. Uh, and there is really no need to be conservative or pad the estimates or be overly aggressive um, and uh, and try to make them very minimal when estimating because uh, you're really, really not sure about who's going to take what work until the very last moment. So it's pretty much uh, you invested in the overall um, in the overall success and overall accuracy. No one really takes ownership of any work item prior to um, spring planning. So when you do uh, backlog refinement or any um, you know any collaboration between the teams in between in between the events, no one really knows who's going to own what. So there is no really there's there is really no one. No one is anchored. It's like I'm going to overestimate this because this is going to be my any pattern. Well, I'm going to make it more aggressive because this other team is there too far ahead of us. They're too fast. They're too effective. Let's create a little bit of a challenge for them. So there was really no need. There was really no incentive to be inaccurate artificially when you estimate. This is a this is a very big. Uh, this is a very loaded slide. Very it's very loaded because it, it gives us six different ways of. Uh, improving or enriching um, collaboration and communication in large scale scrum. Obviously, just talk is, is a very secret technique, um, or just scream as as the just scream is the um, um, you know it's it's the higher version of it. Scouting and traveling, De a developer traveler is a very strongly recommended um, um, role approach to disseminate knowledge laterally from one team to another. Again, it's a very loaded statement. How do you do it? Who does it? How and what? Just consider this. Uh, it, 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 there is an opportunity, and it's it's there's a lot of support uh, and encouragement for an individual with um, senior knowledge to pick up his bags or her bags and travel from one team um, on another team for a couple of sprints and cross pollinate knowledge there. Please do not confuse it with shared resources. There is no such thing as large scale. This is completely different. Um, open space, uh, please do not confuse it with the big room planning, which is a beat up term that is being used traditionally. Uh, an open space does require, as a matter of fact, a big room, lots of air, lots of light, food, but open space implies something completely different. When you have, um, that's why you have everyone, their mother planning or in refining. Uh, in today's day and age, of course, we can talk about mirror boards or mural boards or some other, um, um, facilitation tools and techniques that could be improvised for that. Communities. I mentioned this in a kind of semi-ironic way uh, a couple slides back. We have a very strong emphasis. We make a very strong emphasis on communities uh, that are meant for cross-functional learning, for functional learning. They are by volunteer and only. They can die, they can live on, and they can be sunset or they can be erected as needed. These are not existing or structures on their side. Just to protect the power, the power and control of, of individuals, uh, and within these communities, lots of cross-functional learning takes place. And company mentorship uh, is so critical. Um, those senior people, those senior experts that have knowledge, that used to be owners and managers, are strongly encouraged to become teachers and component owners. Again, it, again, it's a very loaded statement. How do you really do it? I mean, someone has been with the firm for 20 years and they take personal pride in being the gatekeeper of this component. No one can touch that private code. Well, the how I handle it. Uh, if this person turns into a professor of SQL or into a professor of UI UX design, then this person will be properly, and, and, and if he, she, or she is properly positioned, then they may become a very, into a very powerful, they, they, they may become a very powerful amplifier of their skill and seek this knowledge um, to others uh, through potential through communities. And of course, with this um, homogeneity in, in skill set and expertise uh, and, and information flow and transparency and cross pollination with knowledge, you will gradually become uh, a, a system, an ecosystem of people that can very um, eloquently and very fluently speak about uh, complexity and size. And that's what we need uh, when we do estimations. And when we do proper estimation, of course, um, budgeting for whatever work we wanted to do 
we plan to do is going to be um, more accurate. So these are some of the advantages if you want to summarize them. They would be as follows. Teams that work synchronously together side by side on the same widely defined product, real product, not a fake product, not a component. For a real product owner, not a, not a surrogate, not a proxy, proxy, proxy not a TOO, not a, not a product owner per team multiplied by 20. That's not the same. That would actually lead to shared understanding of work and size and complexity and establish more reliable estimation techniques. It's just common sense. I don't think we are reinventing anything here because if people work together, if you know, if you know, take three or nine, three to nine of us, if we work long enough together and learn from each other, we're going to become more, much better gelled and we will be able to estimate better together. <laughs> um, same product owner, shared on the same product vision and strategy is going to lead to better strategic planning. That's another important um, element of, of, of budgeting because based on strategic goals and strategic planning, we decide uh, how much money we will designate, uh, designate for, for work. Uh, obviously, short cycle time and fast feedback loops with better responsiveness to increased and decreased market demands um, and potentially contraction or expansion of the product will also add to accuracy. And of course, close proximity to real customers and users uh, will you know, lead to more thoughtful strategic decisions of funding and budgeting. What does it all, why, why is it all more dynamic? Why do we call it dynamic? Well, dynamic is more reactive, right? It's synonymous to reactive, it's synonymous to uh, nimble, to, it's synonymous to, uh, you know, um, to it's, it's synonymous to agile, or adaptive. And of course, when you have real agile teams uh, working in close proximity, proximity with one another, uh, with very short feedback loop between themselves and the real customer, then making these decisions becomes much easier. And when you have real stakeholders and will and, and real users involved in product development, and they get get the um, the outcome, get the uh, get PSPI very frequently, their ability to gauge and, and change pr priorities and funding is going to be much more. Uh, it's going it, it, it's, it's going to be better. So instead of you know getting something back to uh, back in production every three months or every six months, they will be getting something back uh, maybe every two weeks or maybe every three weeks and then they can do better course correction so if they feel they need to change funding or they need to change um you know uh, how much money they de designate for, their, for the rest of the year they can do it on the fly so there's multiple components accuracy of estimation which is a um, co corollary to in much better much more reliable internal dynamics and close proximity to customer that makes these decisions much more adaptive, much more agile. So those two key things, at least, we can take from this. Of course, if we have a very large organization, very complex framework, or very quasi-unreliable team structure, a quasi scrum then we can apply very sophisticated techniques and tools to estimate. Even we can do earned value management. We can some stuff that is pretty scientific, but it's again like putting a saddle on a cow. It's not going to run it. It's not going to make it run any faster. It's going to still not be a horse. Okay. So I'm going to pause now. I know uh, I'm trying to. I was trying to manage my time. Um, I think I've covered what I needed to cover. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. That's the fast forward. That's just an appendix. Um, I'm going to open up the floor. And maybe there's some questions. Yep, we have about two minutes left for questions. So um, you can either unmute and ask a question or just drop something in the chat box. Uh, let's see, where's the chat here? Um, okay, chat. Five minutes remaining. Oh, I haven't been reading my chat. Um, That's okay. Just look. Is the audio breaking up? Okay, so yes, I'm looking no for- No questions yet at this nope. point. Okay, please, yes, please, please ping there. Actually, it's, I've got a question. I don't know if it's a stupid question or not. Obviously, this is all about large scale, scale Scrum. So the, all the teams are just doing Scrum. There's no team doing Kanban. If there is like a Kanban cadence and then they were working, uh, 
together as a Kanban team, so four or five Kanban teams, or is it just pure Scrum? So I'm in, in, in this specific reference, uh, in this specific conversation, I'm specifically referring to product-centric development when you have clearly identified product, uh, well-defined product, um, customer-centric development, you have a product, clearly identified product owner. In my experience, Scrum is just more um, effective way to do it, especially if you have multiple teams uh, involved. I've worked with plenty with Kanban. I see a huge, I see a huge value in Kanban. Uh, it's just in this case, um, I wouldn't be referring to it. I mean, for maybe for production support of some sort, sure. Uh, but however, however, this is important to understand. Uh, workflow management, uh, queue size management, uh, uh, various techniques that we are very well define in Kanban, the very you know, skillful techniques, uh, you can very well use within Scrum dynamics, like you can manage queues, you can, you know, you, you can, um, you know, uh, encourage uh, no multitasking, um, single task, um, uh, single text workflow management, S stuff that we have coined within, usually within Kanban discussions, you can very swiftly apply within Scrum, but you plan and we, do, we, we use Scrum dynamics, we use Scrum events, roles and responsibilities, um, and artifacts so but i would be careful not to use just because it's it's fancy oh let's let's have the best of all worlds let's just put everything in big you know bucket and do the jambalaya just because it's fancy and because we want to be inclusive i would be very thoughtful about what you add to your uh to your dish and why cool thank you true awesome well, thank you everyone for attending today. I'm going to go ahead.